But good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Will, and I'd like to extend a warm welcome to you all and for all those who are tuning in tonight to our flagship event for Hillary Term, an interview with Dr. Adrian Zenz on the subject of the persecution of the Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang, China. Now, before I go any further, I'd quickly like to alert our audience that for some of the topics we shall be discussing tonight, people may find distressing due to the sensitive nature of the situation. We do expect the topics of mass sexual violence to come up and also forced sterilization. The structure of the event will be as follows. Following a brief introduction from our expert, Dr. Adrian Zenz, we will jump into conversation spanning around 40 minutes, kind of going all the, over all the different factors and facets of the crisis. From there, we will open up the, the discussion to you, the audience, and we'll spend about 15 minutes answering any questions you might have. You'll be able to ask your question directly to Adrian by pressing the raise hand feature. So with that out of the way, let's crack right on. The plight of the Uyghur Muslims has been one of the greatest injustices of modern times, and the underreporting of the situation in Xinjiang by the mainstream media has been scandalous. Tonight, we shall look to one of the leading experts and investigators of the crisis, Dr. Adrian Zenz, to talk us through his own historical backdrop to the crisis, sorry, his own uh, current findings, the historical backdrop, and also how he feels the situation might play out in the future. Adrian is a German anthropologist, having studied by the University of Auckland and later awarded a PhD from the University of Cambridge for his thesis on the livelihoods and identity, identity of young Tibetans. Since then, he has become a senior fellow in China studies at the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation. Recently, Zenz has published a myriad of research into the mass detention of Uyghur Muslims in, in the Xinjiang region. Whilst his work has attracted major criticism from the Chinese government, his investigations have been lauded by many academics and politicians around the world. We are truly, truly incre incredibly fortunate to have him with us tonight. So let's jump right into, I think probably the most natural place to start, Adrian. So the, Jin, the crisis in Xinjiang has been seemingly only made frontline news over the last couple of years. How the persecution of the Uyghur Muslims by the Chinese state has been brewing for a far longer period of time. So Adrian, before we get started fully into today's situation, could you perhaps offer some introductory remarks as to the background of the crisis and the historical tensions between the Han Chinese people and various other ethnic groups in the region? Yes, sure. And uh, thank you for having me today. Um, ethnic relations between uh, the Uyghurs and the Han have been similarly complicated as, for example, between the Tibetans and the Han. Over several centuries, successive Chinese empires have occupied, colonized, or controlled uh, the region that the Chinese call Xinjiang, which means new frontier, uh, for some centuries to various parts. Uh, it was not consistent. Um, ethnic interaction was complicated, complex, um, and became especially fraught after Mao Zedong invaded uh, the region in 1949, ending what was at the time the East Turkestan Republic a very fleeting period of nominal independence of the region. Uh, since then, the Uyghurs, of course, along with many others in China, uh, had to suffer through uh, the, the Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution, all of which came with severe ethnic uh, persecution, discrimination against the ethnic language, against religion in particular, uh, very similar to other ethnic groups. And uh, this all kind of emerged in the 1980s with a relative sort of uh, time of liberalism under Deng Xiaoping, who realized he just needed to give everybody some breathing room and space. However, after Deng Xiaoping, successive Chinese uh, presidents have uh, implemented successively restrictive ethnic policies. Uh, under Hu Jintao, it already started to become more repressive. And of course, Hu Jintao oversaw the time of the uh, Urumqi riots in 2009, which were widely reported. Following ethnic clashes in Eastern China, uh, Han Chinese accused Uyghurs uh, of uh, violating Chinese women, allegations that turned out to be untrue. Uyghurs were shown on video, on camera video, shown uh, be beaten to death brutally. And a bit like the Lhasa, the Lhasa riots in 2008, um, it kind of, it just, it was almost like a pressure valve that went off and just reflective of the basically the failure of Chinese ethnic policy, the underlying failure. Mm. 
Now, instead of responding with trying to address the underlying problems, the Chinese state, uh, especially under Xi Jinping, uh, repressed the Uyghurs even more and uh, set up a veritable police state, introducing the beginnings of re-education in the line of the brutal uh, re-education of the Falun Gong, the brutal brainwashing, uh, starting in 2013 and 14 and culminating most shockingly into the most recent situation, which began effectively, the internment campaign began in 2017, but the parameters were set for it uh, in 2016, really, when the same party, the same uh, party secretary, Chen Chuen Guo, who had pacified and set up a police state in Tibet for five years between 2011 and 16, uh, was transferred in the August of 2016 to Xinjiang. Okay, and I think that kind of leads us perfectly into kind of the modern day situation now. And so I think perhaps the, the most egregious charge, at least in my eyes, that has been leveled towards the authorities in the region since 2017 or so, has been this mass sterilization. Um, initially predicated on eyewitness accounts, the evidence is mounting towards kind of um, in a detailed series of papers. It's been shown that data from state itself are mainly released by you, yourself, Dr. Zenz. Um, some of the numbers here are staggering, 84% reduction in natural population growth in the region. I mean, and near zero birth rate target. I mean, the first question I, I have on this is, um, how accurate are these numbers painting a picture, do you think, of what's going on? And then as an aside to that, why do you think um, the CCP is so happy to release this data into public domain, which then we can kind of make these inferences from? The Chinese Party has for a long time said that um, these policies, the Uyghurs have had uh, too high of a population growth and Uyghur population growth and birth rates have been um, significantly above average, uh, also because of more lenient family planning policies towards them. Um, therefore, the, the most recent draconian measures uh, are hailed by the Chinese as a success and are proudly published and showcased as a successful result that they finally got a grip, got a, um, a handle on what, on, on Uyghur population growth. Um, the numbers are published on different levels and uh, most recently they now have stopped publishing them. <laughs> but um, it's a lot of the data that the Chinese publish basically either fulfills reporting requirements or just showcases what they believe is success, even with also with forced labor. You know, now people who were lazy and just stayed at home, lazy and just stayed at home during the agricultural low season are now hardworking and happily picking cotton, you know? And then you write a hundred propaganda pieces that just show how wonderfully that is working out. Same with yeah. birth prevention. You know, women talk about being liberated. Women speak of, oh, the wonderful birth prevention policies. You know, I get, I can even get a free steriliz uh, sterilization surgery and get, uh, get money paid, uh, premium uh, financial incentives paid for it. And the government gives me free health checks and I can now go and work. I no longer have to stay at home. You know, I'm being liberated here. Uh, and, and that's kind of a proud propaganda piece. But of course, we use high level policies and data and other things to just show what what that really means. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of fascinating, the fact that it's so kind of heavily lauded and praised in the state. And when, when in the West, we regard it with such sort of um, the egregious nature of what's going on there. And then you touched slightly on the coercive labor, Dr. Zenz. I was wondering if you could kind of give our um, our audience kind of a brief account of maybe some of the conditions that the those in these um, cons these coercive labor camps, those Uyghur Muslims, how the conditions they face. And also, um, is there any evidence that the scale of these camps is beginning to downsize at all? In light of all the, the international criticism, is China trying to, try to restrict its um, imposition on the Uyghur Muslims? So in hindsight, it's quite evident that uh, the campaign of extra legal internment in camps was always meant as an intensive shorter term measure that would culminate into a longer term solution. And starting in 2019, we have seen the execution of the longer term solution, which is on the one hand, many Uyghurs getting sentenced to long prison terms. On the other hand, those who have been funneled into the vocational internment camps, which are the ones that the Chinese government talks about, 
and the ones that have been showcased to the world, those lucky enough to end up in those camps at some point, um, many of them are being released and have been released. Many, an unknown number, still remains in camps that have nothing to do with vocational training or even the name vocational in it, that are purely about detention, interrogation, and re-education. And we have frankly have no idea. Some of these camps, according to satellite analysis, have been uh, greatly expanded in size uh, in recent year, or they've turned into been turned into high security facilities. So frankly, an unknown number of persons remains in detention. True is, however, that likely hundreds of thousands have been shifted into forced labor from vocational internment. According to the limited evidence that we have, uh, these factories are on securitized compounds, often with cameras, uh, with, you know, these are closed compounds where you, to enter and uh, go, you have to go through checkpoints. So you can't, get, you can't just get out. Uh, these are often factory complexes where, uh, in some instances, uh, the, the, the Uyghurs still live on the grounds of internment camps. And then in the daytime, they're police escorted to work. In the nighttime, they're police escorted back to their cell. Uh, in other instances, these factories are directly on the grounds of the internment camp. They don't even, even need to lift the perimeter of the camp. And the very, the completely different type of forced labor that also I've described to pick cotton is the so-called labor transfer which is um, basically a second scheme of forced labor unrelated to the vocational internment camps or any internment uh, by which the government goes into every village and whoever is left there, not in a camp, gets rounded up, trained and sent off to work assignments, some of them in Eastern China. The security conditions of those ones can vary a lot. They can end up in private companies. They can end up on securitized compounds in industrial parks. They can be transferred in batches, police accompanied uh, to completely other parts of Xinjiang or China. Uh, they might find themselves in more securitized, closed environments, or they could just be in a local private enterprise. But the, at the very least, their training and recruitment uh, is coercive at yep. the least. Mm. And what do you think accounts for that variation in conditions between the different camps? Is it do you, does it depend on who they, the which Uyghur Muslim they're arresting? Kind of what factors are at play here? Well, that's a very interesting question. Uh, one of the leaked documents, the Karakash list, gave us some detail, uh, and the indication is that those who committed sort of lesser lesser crimes, as the Chinese government actually has officially admitted, those with lesser crimes are put in a vocational camp. And those with more serious crimes are put into other facilities or prisons. And what we know from the uh, government's own documents is that lesser crimes are if you've had too many children, for example, you violated birth control policy, or you have five years ago, your wife used to wear a veil. And that's why you were detained five years later. Or a long time ago, you might have gone on a pilgrimage, or you might have received some uh, instruction, or you might have said a prayer at a funeral, just a nominal cultural religious prayer at a funeral, or you might have been known to attend mosque in the past. Uh, so any even slight cultural religious practice uh, is immediately suspicious and people are liable to be detained for them. And then the more, sev the, the more severe crimes is kind of anything that might endanger state security if you if you were unhappy or and you expressed it and you said something or uh, you wrote, you, you um, maybe you participated in a riot, of course, or they thought you were plotting something, you know, then then you you'll get into the tougher type of institutions. Yeah, that's really interesting. That, is it clear that disparity between kind of these le like lesser crime camps, like the, and that leads to the re-education? Of the or attempted re education of the Uyghur Muslims, and then on the flip side, you've got the more violent and um, kind of righteous, supposedly righteous Uyghur Muslims who are going into the more harsh, harsher camps. So, one thing I just want to kind of shift the conversation onto a little bit is to do with kind of the Chinese response to the allegation and also kind of personal attacks on your own integrity that you've definitely kind of undergone. For example, um, one of the uh, China um, state sponsored uh, websites, Global News, I think has brandished you all sorts of um, kind of accusations, a, a swindler under academic disguise, a, an anti-China expert or a far-right evangelical scholar. 
do you find it hard to kind of uh, when when these criticism level are leveled at you do you find it hard to carry on your investigations or do they perhaps spur you on do they sort of make you more even more keen to investigate yeah it's a good question so um Obviously, these attacks, if, if, there's, if somebody attacks a person's character, it means they cannot attack them on the grounds of their work. So that's always a commendation for the quality of somebody's work. And I think the same applies in this case. It's very dangerous for the Chinese government to uh, attack me on the grounds of my work, because by doing so, they would raise attention to what they themselves have said in their own documents. And that's uh, very problematic for them. But the birth prevention, for the first time, they try to dabble in that by trying to just quote um, numbers in a certain way and the stakes were so high they had to try something so they tried to engage with my work in some way uh, you know but very selective in what they mentioned and what it didn't mention you know so um, yeah typically it's a seal of approval you know you, that one has done something right not only good research but also had like an impact in this sort of in a moral cause really uh, that the Chinese are now really on the defensive that to the extent that they have to attack a Western researcher. I mean, really, you know, and of course, there are many others who I'm not the only one reporting on uh, doing research on Xinjiang. So, but um, I guess for them, it's kind of turned into a strategy. But of course, it's a very desperate strategy. It, it's it's um, kind of a sign of a sign of failure, really. So for me personally, I'm getting used to it. You know, I mostly don't respond or engage with it. It's on rare occasions I've chosen to, where I thought it constructive, uh, it tends to be, um, I tend to ignore it because it, these kinds of things, they're not like, we're not talking a factual engagement. So if you try to engage with that, uh, all you're gonna get back is more personal attack. It, 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 there's not, this is not gonna be a fair argument type thing, fair, fair uh, engagement. Um, it is discouraging to see that there's a substantial number of Westerners or others outside of the Chinese propaganda framework who possibly by virtue of their um, left, far left or extreme far left uh, views or pro-communist views maybe um, choose to believe some of that um, or simply because I have a, a certain faith which in North America is associated with conservative politics, although I'm actually not North American. And for me, the association is not nearly as straightforward as that. Uh, I'm not particularly right wing politically, but nobody asked that question. Um, it, they, they sort of rather prefer to believe one side. And there's not very much I can do about that, frankly. No, I think, that's, I think that's fair enough. But it sounds like you kind of you do take a sensible approach to these and don't really rise to the kind of character assassinations or such. Yeah, I I mean, it's, it's, much it's, of that is trying to bait me. You know, it's trying yeah. to like I'm. It's baiting somebody into a response and then give it more attention. And I mean, it's so it's like it's like a bully at school. You know, who tries to get attention in some way and throws some mud at you and hopes you'll throw it back, and then they'll get more attention that way. And the best is to just clear clear off the mud and just keep going. Yeah, no, very very good advice. And so I'm kind of as an as added aside to that, I just quite quite quickly want to discuss kind of your own methods for gathering data because much as we discussed earlier, much of your um, your facts and your figures come from the state government itself. But I was wondering, sort of maybe other things, eyewitness, eyewitness accounts, CCTV, or even satellite imagery. How much do these factors come into sort of your your own investigations? Yeah, so especially uh, especially early on when uh, we were looking at uh, the internment camps and I was writing the piece on the on the camps, um, satellite images were quite important. Now it's gotten harder and harder to triangulate them. So some people now just try to scan like SP, the SP think tank just scans whole regions, you know, for camps. But that's not what I do. So I, I looked more at satellite in 2018. Um, and sometimes, I mean, here and there you always still do for a particular case. But it's not a main, it's, a, it's an important supplementary data point for me. Uh, interviews the same. So uh, witness accounts are very important. They often break open a topic in the first place. They uh, raise awareness, oh, there is sterilization. There is rape. There is torture. Many of these things you, you find out, also the camps, anything, almost anything, forced labor, anything you find out first through witness statements. So then my job is kind of to follow this up. Of course, I read them, I, I look at them, I talk to people, 
But my job really is to follow this up uh, with the documentary side and the policy side. I'm trying to see, is there a policy? Is there uh, evidence on the Chinese internet in the form of, so I often triangulate data sources. So I will take government policy documents, then local county reports on different levels of administrative units. I look at state media, I look at propaganda, reading between the lines of propaganda is very important, for example, for parent child separation, you know, when they were praising, they were saying, oh, these great vocational uh, centers, you know, and the parents study and then work and the kids live in full time uh, boarding kindergartens, boarding preschools, and it's good for them, the kids now finally learn some good habits and they brush their teeth and all that. So uh, you read between the lines. And, and so you get a whole bunch of very important data points. That's very interesting. You qu quickly pick up on one thing you said at the end there, talking about the children. I mean, is this is this issue in these camps affecting people of all generations, all ages, all uh, all sexes, things like that, or is it tend to be kind of directed more towards kind of the middle aged males sort of thing? Uh, so the data I have, and I, I did manage to obtain some also some non public data with spreadsheets about of internments with uh, people's. Uh, ID number and with the Chinese ID number, you can always get the date of birth is coded into the ID number. So then you know the age. And so um, basically I did a histogram comparing that to the average age distribution based on the 2010 census in Xinjiang. And I found that it heavily, uh, and also from the list itself, it heavily targeted heads of households. Male heads, are, so 80, 90% men, and many of them in the age bracket between 30 and 50 or 55. Uh, you know, you're talking influencers, community leaders, heads of households, people who have some say, some influence, they were taking those out. Yeah, I mean, that's quite a telling picture there. 80, 90% just directed that one substrata. Definitely a focused, focused move from the local authorities. AKA yeah, so you see the, if you see the videos, the propaganda videos from China, right? They show, they show pretty women, pretty young females dancing and young males, you know, and as, as if they were students, 50, 50, nicely sitting in rows. That is completely, that, that is a completely unrepresentative demographic sample compared to who's really in the camps. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And I just before we quickly move on, I'm just going to remind the audience that we will be coming to audience questions in about 20 minutes. And so if you've got anything uh, you maybe want to ask Dr. Zenz, make sure to keep it in mind. And when it comes to the time, I'll make sure to let you ask your question. But moving swiftly on, I'd like, I'd like to now turn to the conversation of the international responses towards the crisis in Xinjiang. You know, a large proportion of the current discussion is centered around the difference between crimes against humanity and genocide and these kind of technical definition. I mean, the former focuses on personal rights, encapsulating killing of large members of individuals, whereas genocide tends to be directed towards systematic destruction of groups. I mean, how do you think we can apply these definitions to the persecutions we see today in Xinjiang? Yeah, so, um, the, the exile Uyghurs in particular, they, they reach for the word genocide. And, and many of us who work closely with it, in, I mean, in some way, genocide is in some ways the only term that fully captures just how bad it is. But the legal definition of genocide is still heavily tied, well, is at least partially in popular notion also tied to mass murder. And the legal definition is not exclusively tied to mass murder, but it has a strong requirement to demonstrate the intent to destroy a group at least in part, which is at least, which means physical destruction of life. Um, so, it, it's tricky terrain. It's, it's, it's really something for the lawyers, you know. The lawyers, of course, are emotionally highly removed from the Uyghurs and um, the international community. And so I sort of think, I, I, I tend to think that people who end up determining it to be genocide, I think I have long argued against this being about mass murder. This is not about mass killing. It never will be, in my opinion. It's not, it's not the ideology. However, there is the intent of destruction and harm on so many levels, including the prevention of life through birth prevention. And through birth prevention, you can actually achieve negative population growth. You can suppress the birth rate. So far, it's below the death rate. 
and then effectively you are reducing the population. So um, I tend to agree with those who say, uh, like also the new administration in the US, you know, Anthony Blinken, Secretary of State, he said, I agree that this is a genocide. Even if State Department lawyers said, well, technically a bit hard because we need to prove this intent. But he said, look, to, to me, this looks like genocide. And I mean, I think on a number of levels, I would really say that's a good determination simply because there is no better word. It's an ethnocide. And so I think it's a good thing to determine it that way. And I think we need to have a slightly more flexible take on genocide that takes different things into account. Okay, that's definitely interesting. I mean, I think that's kind of, uh, we're going to see in the coming months and years, more and more countries turn towards accepting that definition in this scenario. And just kind of quickly, as because we are here, the Oxford Forum for Questioning Extremism, based on lots of different forms of extremism. I was wondering, Adrian, your opinion, in your professional opinion, would you describe what the situation we see today? And if China is responsible, would you describe them as an extremist government? The Chinese. Yes, extremist. Well, I would, uh, you would have to give me your definition of extremism for me to answer that question, but I would quite readily describe them as a, in essence, fascist government that uses the, me the methods of fascism um, to, to, to stay in power and achieve their goals. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think that it's hard. It can be quite hard to define the term, but it's more seeing if you could, yeah, as you say, relate it to our own kind of mandate here at the OFQE. The, met the methods are extreme. The methods yeah. are extreme. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. I mean, that seems pretty clear cut then. But yeah. Okay. I mean, cool. Of course, we also do, we do need to acknowledge that there is at least some, at some level, there is a religious extremist problem, uh, problem among a number of Muslim groups in the Middle East and Central Asia, and that does include the Uyghurs. The Uyghurs did commit violent acts. But the, prob the thing is, the, the, the religious extremism is completely blown out of proportion, applied, uh, imp imputed to much of the population. Uh, and Uyghurs, uh, many Uyghurs actually kind of seized uh, re religiosity, kind of uh, maybe more like to frame their, their, their um, their, their, their fight against grievance, you know, their guerrilla warfare against grievance and discrimination. So it's, and yes, some of them were trained uh, uh, among uh, jihadists in abroad. Uh, but first, it, not just, it's, it's not just blown out of proportion. You also need to look at the roots of that, right? So the roots of why would Uyghurs turn to religious uh, Islamic extremism is, is not the, the, the Islamic extremism. It's, their root problem with the Chinese government and what happened in the last 50, 100 and more years. Okay, yeah, no, and that, and then kind of leading on to something we, we were talking about just before to the international response and the, in particular, the UN mandate. So in July of 2019, we saw an intriguing split in the UN Human Rights Council on a bill brought to condemn China's actions. Whilst only 22 countries actively denounced the actions of the CCP. Um, uh, declare we saw a similar uh, number slightly more in fact show their support and their backing of the authorities in Xinjiang and we saw this um split enacted again in October later that year I mean why do you think countries are so reluctant to unify and castigate China's behavior because China has a lot of economic power and clout and is uh, ruthless in deploying it and everybody knows that everybody knows China ruthlessly uses it's the bargaining chips that it has and um, people, countries and governments tend to be very cautious uh, about trying to offend such a powerful country. And, and for the Chinese Communist Party, becoming economically powerful has always been a goal precisely for that reason, because they know better than many others that that is the best way to actually keep others quiet and stay in power. And yeah, and definitely something you touched on there was that economic power and might of China. I, I acknowledge this might not be your um, kind of your specialty and your strong suit, Dr. Zenz, but I was wondering kind of in, in kind of bring it slightly more topical to the UK here. In the post-Brexit era, there's been sort of much talk about trade deals and things like that. I mean, the EU recently signed at the end in December, in late December last year, recently signed an investment treaty with China, uh, which alarmed main UK. I mean, what did you make of this decision? And do you think the EU is setting a dangerous precedent with this economic new economic deal. 
I think it is um, very problematic because they don't realize that China does not keep to treaties. Uh, China uses treaties uh, for its own advantage. And it's very ruthless in what it does. And especially the window dressing with the supposed forced labor stipulation and ILO fulfillment is, is complete, a complete force. And actually, they, I think the Europeans know that. They know it. But they completely just push this through. It's very short-sighted and it's quite, it's quite dangerous, actually, because it, it, it's, it's born out of a great deal of naiveness. And it's, of course, politically and diplomatically, the completely wrong signal, you know? handing the Chinese this diplomatic victory at a time when China has just done horrendous things, both in Hong Kong and Xinjiang, threatening Taiwan, killing Indian soldiers on the border. I mean, it's almost like rewarding uh, bad behavior. Uh, and almost it, it makes Europe look, look really weak in China's eyes. And the Chinese detest this weakness and will ruthlessly exploit it. I mean, yeah, and that's, that's a kind of a very strong and in, uh, intriguing take. I mean, coming and then back and cross onto the British Isles now. I mean, I'm not sure how much you're following sort of British vice politics, but I mean, a group of um, sort of Tory MPs have been looking to uh, block any new trade deal with China, um, or specifically any nation that violates genocide laws. And by ex by extent, in, in Ian Duncan Smith, the kind of cabal leader, he would say that that China is also guilty of that. I mean, would you like to see the UK take a far bolder stance, similar to that scene kind of in? by Trump and then Biden, as you said earlier, for the new administration and declare the situation in China as a genocide? Yes, I think governments should declare things for what they are, no matter if you uh, make somebody angry. I mean, what, what, how should, I mean, Britain's, uh, which approach to Hitler was better, you know, Chamberlain's or his successors? I mean, really? There's, you know, Xi Jinping is not committing mass murder, but in so many other ways, the parallels to Nazi Germany are, unfortunately, uh, and I'm not saying this in a populist way, unfortunately, um, uh, uh, very strong. And um, so what, how do you treat a strong man? You know, Hitler, according to his own words, despised those at the Munich Treaty in uh, 1938 or when it was, who sort of conceded Poland or uh, conceded, no, sorry, conceded part of the Czech Republic or the Sudetenland to Germany and made, try to make a compromise and appeasing. And Hitler dis just ridiculed their weakness and said, they are no nobodies. I can just walk right over them. And so he did with, by invading Poland. And so I think it's very similar here. I think you just, we gotta speak up for other human beings. You know, if, if a genocide or an atrocity is being committed, we should, we should, make that determination and call it that. It doesn't mean we have to completely divest from China. And you know what? China's still gonna sell us things, even if we call it a genocide. They're still, they're still selling goods to the United States. Why? Because it's an interest. Yeah, I mean, I think you, you paint a kind of fairly damning comparison there comparing it with the situation of the 1930s. But I think, as you said, there are some very comparable um, issues at hand. I mean, one, I think one really interesting aspect of the international response has been that of the Middle Eastern um, region, especially the kind of predominantly Muslim countries. I mean, we see, for example, um, Saudi Arabia and Egypt have expressed pretty strong support um, for the Chinese state, whereas in comparison, Turkey has taken a far greater condemnation of the CCP. I mean, how do you think the situation in Xinjiang is going to affect the relations in the Middle East in the coming months? So Turkey had one strong thing right before local elections, and that was the last thing they ever said on it. Uh, and Erdogan is happily talking to the Chinese and allowed himself to be quoted by Chinese state media saying some favorable things about what they do in Xinjiang. So I think that Turkey thing, uh, we have to really take off the table here. So I think really the Muslim majority countries have by and large sold out on the way, have sold out the Uyghurs, you know, it's like, never mind, you know. We want Chinese money. Uh, so it's obviously a huge problem, and but it shows the China's success with China's Belt and Road Initiative. You know, the Belt and Road Initiative is a huge promise to countries with low economic power, and there's nothing like it. There's no, no real competition to China's Belt and Road Initiative. There's no Western Marshall Plan that can rival that. And so it, it's having the desired political outcome. There's no question about it. China is gaining huge influence, and that's not likely to change anytime soon. Mm, I mean, and this kind of this sprawling of China's influence definitely seems to be 
um, concerning, especially relating to the Xinjiang um, crisis. I mean, you talked more about you, you want to see a greater condemnation internationally of the CCP. I mean, as you said, it's kind of easier said than done. I mean, what sort of steps do you think need to be taken by um, kind of governments and national governments? Is it literally a matter of just sort of saying, right, we, we're going to sort of take an economic, potentially take an economic hit here, but as you say, look out for our fellow humans around the world. I mean, is there any more practical steps you'd like to see governments take? Yes, absolutely. The first thing is to speak out and call the child by its name. Uh, if you can't even do that, then what else are you going to even do? So I think that's very much the first step, but it shouldn't stay like that. So what political, what specific steps can be done? I think there can be political and diplomatic consequences uh, at multilateral institutions or in other ways uh, on, on the diplomatic side of things. It, it comes to like agreements. There's, for example, if the European Union had said, look, Look at what you have done in Xinjiang and Hong Kong. We are sorry, but this deal is off. We can't do this. That would have been a diplomatic message and it would have spoken loudly. But I think even more effective are economic measures, combating forced labor through import stops, um, possibly economic sanctions, um, uh, divest, you know, cutting off technology supply of technology that could uh, aid in the oppression of the Uyghurs, although in, by now it's kind of almost too late because most of the technology is home de, homegrown. So stuff like this, or Huawei, you know, Huawei is, is um, complicit in, in what's going on in Xinjiang. And um, that should be taken into account and should be openly stated when governments say, you know, I'm sorry, there's several reasons we can't do this. And one of them is the human rights violations. Because when, once there's a real loss of money, that's, that's when the, the Chinese government is forced to pay an actual real price for what it, for the atrocity it's committing. And that's what's needed. The world, the global community has to make sure that, that China is paying a price for this atrocity. Um, yeah, I mean, that kind of thing at least perfectly onto the kind of final, I think, segment of um, the situation here. And it's kind of the, tra the response of transnational corporations. You've already mentioned Huawei, then you have different clothing brands, Nike being a very prominent one. I mean, the statistics like speak for themselves, 20% of the world's cotton is produced in Xinjiang. And I mean, if that is being kind of severely um, kind of coming out of these forced concentration camps, I mean, do you think we as consumers should be taking a firmer stance or is it the role of governments to be trying to kind of, um, prevent or at least diminish the amount of cotton coming from this region? Uh, it would be both. Actions should be taken at, at every level. Sometimes you can't rely on uh, the government to do anything. Consumer awareness is a very big thing, absolutely. But ideally, of course, it should not just be the owners of consumers or companies. It should really uh, be dealt with at a political level. Okay, yeah. I and mean, I think that is definitely something that needs to be seen. I mean, do you think we kind of here in the UK should be take, be more aware of sort of where our cotton is coming from. Do you think, I mean, what should we as kind of civilians in a international country be, should be our number one focus in trying to kind of change and uh, improve the situation? There should be strong labeling and supply chain transparency requirements. And um, to, to inform consumers and companies should be open, should be forced to, to say, okay, look, this is how we're sourcing. Um, so that consumers can make choices. But I think it could also be up to consumers to say, okay, this, this is a cotton product and it says made in China. Or even if it's made in Bangladesh, you want to ask companies, okay, so you are getting a lot of your cotton from there. So where is it coming from? What, what measures, are you, what steps are you taking? If a lot of consumers, if everybody on this Zoom presentation would write a couple letters to a couple of companies or trade uh, or, or industry uh, unions, um, it would have a, a real effect. I mean, I think, yeah, that, that, I hope everyone is li listening in there and kind of taking note of sort of the situation and how we ourselves are kind of sort of how our lives are affected by the cotton that comes out of the region. Okay, and finally, before we move on to the audience questions, and I will give one final reminder to get thinking of your questions, put them to Dr. Zenz, I'm sure he'd be happy to take them. So I just want to finally ask, I mean, where do you see these crises going in both the, the short, medium and long term, the next couple of months, maybe even the, over the next couple of years? 
I mean, do you think we'll ever see, we'll ever see united consensus of nations coming out and criticism of the CCP? Are you that optimistic? I mean, what are your thoughts? Um, well, apart from the joint letters, mostly written by Western countries, that we have seen some, because China just counters them and tries to ignore them. And of course, China gets a couple dozen other countries to countersign a counter letter. So um, I'm not super optimistic on multilateral action, especially the European Union has shown itself to be a really toothless tiger. The UK government is being fairly opportunistic, I think. It's, it's really trying to not spoil its relationship with China. It's not super keen to speak out. It's been very cautious. So again, they're hedging their bets. Canadian government, the same, you know, the parliaments, yeah, the parliaments can do things, but the governments are very slow. So I'm, I'm quite pessimistic. Uh, the United States has gone ahead. I expect under the current Biden administration, I, I hope at least that it will continue in constructive ways and engaging allies. But generally speaking, it's surprising how little spine the world community shows, of course, especially the Muslim countries are a huge letdown. But the, the world really isn't showing a lot of spine, you know, they're not, I'm sorry, they're really not sort of, yeah, they, they, they're kind of just setting this out. They're just setting this out, really. And a lot of companies too, a lot of companies who are sourcing from the region, they're just trying to set this out. And then, then more and more research comes out and then like, oops. And then, okay, in the US, we can't use cotton anymore from Xinjiang, but in other countries, we still can. You know, so, I mean, it's, it's very inadequate in the face of such a severe atrocity. Yeah, I mean, I know it's a pretty, pretty pessimistic picture, but let's hope in the coming months and years, we'll see more countries come out in criticism of the region. Okay, so that's been an incredibly fascinating last 40 minutes or so in a conversation between Dr. Zenz and I. But now I'm going to open up to you guys in the audience to put your question towards um, our guest this evening. So I'm going to start, kick it off with Freddie. Um, I think you should be able to talk now if you unmute yourself. Hi. We can hear you now, loud and clear. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Zenz, for coming on. Um, it's been an absolutely fantastic, fascinating and insightful um, discussion so far. My question is about um, Islamist extremism within the region, um, more, more specifically about radicalization. Um, do you expect there to be more attacks done on maybe a very local level um, by radicalized religious fundamentalists? And do you expect that to be used by the Chinese government to further justify their actions within the region? Yeah, so um, the organized resistance in Xinjiang um, really started to dwindle after 2015. And, you know, some of the attacks in 2016 and early 17 were lone wolf attacks. You know, some enraged husband uh, took a knife and uh, tried to jab some Chinese officers, you know, really lone wolf attacks. So there's no absolute, there's absolutely not a trace of organized resistance within China. And even outside, there really isn't very much at all, really not. It's being quite exaggerated. So I think it's not likely that this happens. And the Chinese, of course, have great taps on it. If anything happened, they would have absolutely exploit it. Of course, what the Chinese are doing uh, is actually very likely to promote extremism, uh, whether it be religious extremism or mental breakdown or anything. Uh, they're creating psychopaths. They're creating wounded people. Uh, they are trying to stomp out a religion. Uh, historically, if people have tried to stomp out a religion, it has tended to promote it. It has tended to promote extremist responses. Um, and it, it has generally not gone well unless they more or less uh, obliterated the whole group. Um, therefore, in my opinion, what China does a very dangerous strategy that's likely to breed some something very unhealthy, but it's very hard to say how that could possibly erupt or not or um, express itself. Um, there's currently really not an indication even outside of China that Uyghurs are systematically developing some kind of resistance that could they could bring back to China. I know there was one video that threatened that, but really I think it's quite an over, you know, it's it's it, it's not a, not a credible sort of threat as far as we know. Thank you. Thank you. That's a really interesting answer. Um, one very briefly follow up um, is why do you think other organizations haven't, um, you know, tried, tried to show some resistance or get into the region? 
Is it just because China has too much control? Other uh, Islamic extremist groups, you mean? Yeah, to... yeah. Um, yes, China does have control. And the question is really other, other Islamist uh, groups probably have their own interest. They have their own turf. So why lose blood in China when you are already losing blood in Afghanistan or in uh, Syria or wherever? Uh, also, of course, with the collapse of ISIS, that of course greatly weakened all that. If ISIS had been successful, they might have started to look out to expand, you know, and send out little commando teams or something. But of course, that's not happening. You know, they basically were defeated at home, pretty much. Um, therefore, there currently is just not. Also, I really don't think that Muslim sympathies are, re are, are, are that real, you know, that they're sympathetic enough to say, OK, we are just going to die in China for your sake. Um, I mean, there might be some who are highly ideological who might be willing to do that, but I don't think we have seen that. Uh, but yes, Chinese border control is very tight and become even tighter since. So there's a number of factors involved. Thank you, Freddie, and thank you, Adrian, for that answer. I'll just quickly jump to a question that was put in the chat about uh, 20 minutes ago. It's from Rosie. Uh, she says, hi there, Dr. Zenz. What was it that um, instigated your, uh, re your kind of research into China and um, kind of focusing on this topic in particular? And have you always been fascinated by China? Uh, no, no, not always. But for my PhD, I really was very interested in the minority education system in China as a rising superpower with a Tibetan. I was looking at Tibetan education and um, the development, employment. Um, I was really fascinated, especially by the Tibetan situation at the time. And um, then in 2016, I, uh, it was brought to my attention that some of this data work could be very pertinent with the evolving uh, police state uh, in Xinjiang. Okay, that's fascinating stuff. Okay, so we're going to jump to Jemima now, who is going to speak to us. Jemima, can can you hear us? Hello, yes, can you hear me? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, thank you. This has been such a fascinating discussion, um, and thank you so much for your answers so far. Um, I wanted to ask you about how, um, how you see the effects of this unfolding in a bit more detail. So I wondered what you thought about whether the um, control that's shown in Xinjiang specifically is likely to be spread to other regions, what with so many surveillance cameras and all these kinds of things being sold and techniques being taken um, into different regions um, in China and whether you think that would spread beyond China itself. And also as a kind of pair to that, what do you think the effect could actually be if we were able to hold China responsible? So we see we have long seen cross fertilization like a lot of the techniques and surveillance te tactics in Xinjiang were first developed in eastern Chinese cities. Uh, and then or in Tibet also and then brought to Xinjiang but now Xinjiang has become almost like the perfect laboratory for surveillance and control and uh, things are being perfected and refined and developed there. Uh, even Huawei has a research lab there for <laughs> with the police for surveillance, you know, and so. Um, we are seeing, uh, I think, already, for example, the use of the forced labor transfer scheme. I was able to prove that Tibet is now using that. Start, it started in 2019. So we see some reintroduction. I'm sure we are seeing some of the techniques and tactics learned in Xinjiang being applied in Hong Kong and other parts of China. Uh, we just don't have, you know, and there's been some, you know, Hong Kong police who had some exchanges for Xinjiang police and police from some other Muslim parts in uh, like Ningxia in, in Gansu uh, in China, uh, went to Xinjiang to learn from them. So <laughs> we definitely see some of that. And also some Chinese companies, including Huawei and others have sold citywide uh, smart city systems, which include surveillance components, intelligent city systems uh, to Zimbabwe, to Central Asia, there's Chinese cameras in Bishkek, uh, Kyrgyzstan, uh, supposedly the system was given for free as long as the Chinese can have the, da the data too, because they like to watch the Uyghurs there. So there's all kinds of stuff going on. When I, the, Central Asia already, we see the export, I think Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan also. I remember reading of Chinese um, surveillance technology and systems and software. So that's just going to continue really over time. And China, the long-term outcome is China's trying to strengthen the back of any authoritarian um, 
any authoritarian uh, regimes. So they, they want, want to make the world a safer place for authoritarianism. Um, right, sorry. Don't that leads right into the consequences of what happens if we counter China, we make the world a more difficult place for authoritarianism. So I think we need to counter that because if we are just passive, China is going to China is going to progressively strengthen uh, anti-democracy, surveillance, police state, and authoritarianism throughout the world because that's in their interest. It makes them stronger at home. It makes the world a safer place for their brand of authoritarianism. And therefore, there's a huge need to fast to counter it. Thank you, Jemima, and thank you, Dr. Ten, for that answer. I just we got a flood of questions coming in. And so maybe if we could have, maybe limit the responses slightly just so we can get around to everyone's question. But um, Hannah in the chat asks, how does the Chinese media report on Xinjiang within China itself? And how have the Chinese public responded? The Chinese, of course, portrayed as um, a necessary helpful steps, you know, helping the Uyghurs, developing them, alleviating them from poverty, training those who are more radical. And it, the Han Chinese population has on the whole, be, they're not sympathetic to the resistance struggle or the grievances of minorities. So the Lhasa uprising, or the Urumqi riots, they heavily condemn that. And then the attacks by Uyghurs, especially in Kunming, the Han Chinese were crying out to the government and said, wow, you got to stop these horrendous Uyghurs. And so their views of the Uyghurs is very, very negative. And therefore they by and large condone what is going on. There are some signs for some of the most recent reports now, if the Chinese are really exposed to the, the full scale of the atrocity and uh, they can get thoughtful or even, yeah, they, 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 that, that can be very helpful, but that's a huge problem, of course, because the China, China controls the narrative. Yeah, definitely, for sure. And thank you for that question from Hannah. Okay, moving swiftly on to you, Angela. Um, Angela, can you hear us? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, Lana Glow. Okay, so um, thank you again for your answers. And my question is kind of similar to the previous one. So I'm just wondering, um, do, you, what, do you see any change? Um, do you see the possibility of any change happening like inside um, China? So do you think um, there's a chance that the Chinese people can play a role in sort of like improving the situation? Or do you think because of the propaganda, because of the, um, like how this um, issue is underreported in China, there is really like not much hope that um, this any change can come within come from within China. Realistically, there's very little hope. Uh, if, the, if something drastic would have to happen, for example, a torture video of a camp, you know, or something really drastic, and people could see, oh, this is real and it's happening to a Uyghur and maybe uh, multiple of them, and then they get leaked on the Chinese internet, they go like wildfire, this, the census delete them, and of course the Chinese know if the census are deleting something, it's something government doesn't want. So, and then maybe that combined with some other insights and actually looking at uh, Chinese government documents and what they really say, uh, something would really have to, s multiple somewhat unlikely things would have to come together to do something significant. And even then it would create awareness in all kinds of Chinese, but even then what would that, how would they, you know, if the government would cave into any of that or give heed to any of it, it they don't tend to do that. It's a sign of weakness. So um, it's, it's unfortunately very unlikely. Thank you, Angela. And thank you for that response again, Dr. Zen. So I'm now gonna move on to um, uh, Dane Rogers. Um, You've already asked a couple of questions in the chat as well, so maybe if you can combine them into one question. Dane, are you there? Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Zen. Um, I'll, uh, uh, the first thing is just that I found some uh, evidence of something quite explosive that it would be nice to uh, talk to you about uh, via email form, but um, that can wait. Um, do you think there's evidence that part of the reason why the Chinese government is clamping down so heavily is because of large oil reserves in the region? And as a follow-up question, do you know of any evidence of oil companies operating in the region specifically contributing to the human rights abuses, similarly to uh, BP's uh, ongoing actions in occupied West Africa or some of Shell's historical behavior in the Niger Delta, where they uh, deliberately collaborated with the government there to ensure that uh, activist protesting against them were killed? I, I just wondered if you had evidence of those things at all. 
Yeah, there is oil, but um, but that's done by Chinese companies. I don't, I'm not aware of Western collaborations, uh, but I can't say I've investigated that particular subject. And I'm very sorry, but I just managed to not quite audibly understand the gist of your first question uh, for audio volume and other reasons. I don't know if William uh, managed to, could give me a very brief summary or Unfortunately, I think I was in the same boat there. I think it crackled out on my end. I mean, uh, Dane, you'd quickly want to sort of um, re reiterate the bit he's um, Dr. Sen is referring to. Sorry, um, bad signal. I was actually asking about Chinese or Congolese for what it's worth. Um, my question, how much do you think the clampdown is because of large oil reserves in the Xinjiang region at all, would you say? Oh, because of natural resources. Yes, natural resources, including gas. I think it's more gas, possibly. Uh, coal, you know, uh, ores. Um, so natural resources uh, are very, very significant. Uh, Xinjiang is a very major, uh, uh, is very rich in natural resources that are, ver are very strategic for China. So Xinjiang has a very strategic uh, role uh, for a number of reasons, geopolitically because of the Belt and Road bordering eight countries and also for natural resource reasons. Yes, absolutely. Yes. So that would of course further increase the Chinese inclination to just uh, ruthlessly stomp out any resistance at any cost because they can absolutely not afford to lose any of that. Thank you, Dane, for that question. I'm sure Dr. Zenz, am I right in saying um, you'd be happy for us to pass on your email so you can discuss that um, uncovery Dane has made to the Oxford and the off links with the Xinjiang region? Would that be okay? Uh, yes, possibly. I'm just extremely swamped right now. So please yeah. give me well, I I cannot that's, that's email. But fair. also the natural resource angle, I cannot say that that's my, my, my uh, research uh, specialty. I'm broadly aware of it, but I don't have any added insights beyond. Uh, okay, thank, thank you, Dr. Sands. Thank you, Dane. I think we've probably got time for one more question. I'm sorry if you didn't get a chance to ask your question, um, but we have just been inundated with, with various audience members. So finally, Alex. Um, do you want Alex, you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you, am I, am I yes. Loud and clear, far away. Fantastic. Um, Dr. Zenz, uh, as we know, Xi Jinping, Chinese Communist Party, has a highly sophisticated propaganda apparatus, and one of the communist attacks on proponents uh, of the truth about the Xinjiang concentration camps is the homogeneity of sources. What do you think the international community can do to improve access by news organizations into the Xinjiang region? Very little, but I would like to say that the, uh, the sources are not as homogenous as China likes to paint them. One of the, the big propaganda strategies of China and of far left, uh, far left Western groups is to claim that much of the sources either come from myself or just a handful of uh, key witnesses uh, who are paid off or something. If you look at the evidence, uh, there's actually a huge range of evidence. Uh, the, the New York Times, uh, Xinjiang files, the ICIJ, China cable investigation. Um, you have uh, witnesses, you have a huge number of witnesses. You have the Xinjiang victims database, you have a, a huge diversity, and you have some pretty good reporting. You know, the BBC videos on the camps and on mosques, they did a fantastic job of just trying to uh, capture some of the, 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 the contradictions and, and the problems, you know, and some other reporting that we have seen in Xinjiang by the Western media has really, really contributed. Uh, so I would be very careful and, um, in presenting the evidence as overly homogenous, because actually it's a lot more diverse uh, than some people think or that the Chinese gov government would like us to believe. But to answer you, again, your question, improving access, um, my goodness, I mean, <laughs> I can't, they're so determined, you know, and they're so skilled in, in thwarting access. And look what they did with the BBC last time. Uh, you know, with the cotton reporting and then shooting against them, trying to manipulate everything, even using their own police video to try to distort. You know, they, of course, they take their own video of these incidents when they block the, the BBC. Uh, so uh, it's the, the counter propaganda narratives getting more and more sophisticated on the Chinese side. And of course, that runs counter to any, uh, the ability of Western journalists to investigate in Xinjiang is getting worse and worse. And I don't see how that's going to change. Thank you very much for that question, Alex. And I think we're going to call it a wrap there because we have sort of hit our allotted hour timing. But I just 
extend a massive thank you to our guest speaker tonight, Dr. Adrian Zenz. You've definitely talked us through an incredible, an incredible amount of detail, the situation in Xinjiang, and I hope that our audience members have learned a lot this evening about the situation, and perhaps some of them may be more inclined to take up and investigate further and maybe see what they themselves can get involved with to help those less fortunate and kind of trapped in this awful situation in the region. Thank you very much, Dr. Zenz, once more. And I've been Will Feezy. This has been Ofqua, and I hope you all have a lovely rest of the evening. Thank you. Thank you.